I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's joined us online for this opening session of Henley and Partners 15th Annual Global Citizenship Conference. My name's Juliet Foster and the title of today's webinar is Positive Migration Policy in the 21st Century. Now, the history of humankind is one of migration. Most of us need only go back a few generations to discover that our ancestors left their homes to start again somewhere new, often with very few resources and possessions. Well, this scenario has come to define the modern era, along with the fact that we're facing the largest displacement crisis on record. Climate change is here and now, and our daily news feeds are filled with images and reports of countries around the world suffering the consequences. Add to this the undeniable reality that the world is becoming increasingly volatile with frequent social unrest, even in once stable democracies. The most optimistic view on the future indicates that large swathes of people will have to migrate in order to survive. But what's happening in terms of migration policy? Well, joining me on today's panel to discuss the status quo and how more welcoming migration policies towards refugees, international talent and indeed investors alike could benefit everyone are Professor Mahari Tadele Maru. He's a fellow at the United Nations University Institute on Comparative Regional Integration Studies and he's also a part-time professor at the Migration Policy Centre. Also, we're joined by Dr. Christian H. Kalin. He's the chairman of Henley and Partners and also an investment migration expert. Gentlemen, it's very good to see you. Christian, let me start first with you because in many ways, I feel that I under-described you by simply calling you an investment migration expert because in fact, you were the one who really pioneered the industry in the 1990s and set the template. So clearly, you had the foresight to see the immense potential in this area, but no one could have actually seen the events of the past few years and the impact they've had on the world. So given that, can you tell us about how by making adjustments to their migration policies, countries could actually stand to benefit from what's happening now? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, these are all very interesting aspects and questions, which of course, you know, we'll need a whole day to, <laughs> to discuss. So let me be concise, but before I, I come to that, you know, it's now the 15th uh, conference, which due to the global situation, we decided to still do online with a number of very specific um, topical discussions like this one. And when we, when we did the first conference 15 years ago, um, people thought we are, you know, crazy to, to do an event on investment migration. We did that together with HSBC Bank. And it was called the Global Citizenship Conference between Henley Partners and, and, Henley, and HSBC. And, you know, we had to pay in advance the conference organizer to do it because they didn't believe in that. Now, today we have something like three to five events per week worldwide including large conferences, seminar, and so on. I mean, it's pre-pandemic uh, situation. So it has changed completely and is re very reflective of, of one uh, aspect of your question, and that is investment migration has really become a, a global trend that is basically unstoppable. Um, but that is the same with uh, what you also mentioned, the global refugee crisis. I also think that is unstoppable and it's only going to get worse First of all, because the volatility of the world. Uh, so globally, you have more and more people, you know, in volatile environments, be that civil war or other internal conflict or even external conflict between countries now. So or where people are aware or fearful of. So people are seeking safe places. And then you have climate change, which will lead, depending on the estimate you, you take, but, you know, it'll leave another 50 to several hundred million people homeless in the quite near future. So we all need to wonder what will happen to the world with all these displaced people. Of course, the same, you know, issues, they fuel in a way also the trend to investment migration, because those people who, who are able to afford you know, to invest and, and set up businesses in other countries, they increasingly do so for international diversification, 
of their you know of their family of their businesses to just be secure so in many countries in the world you know they don't need to be threatened by climate change and they don't need to be at civil war right now but in many countries in the world people are looking at alternatives including in countries like the united states for example you know where people are increasingly you know concerned with the very polarized political landscape and where that leads to so they might look at more you know peaceful environments or simply plan b besides the global mobility need so we have observed in the last uh, many years and certainly in the last 15 years since we do these um, global conferences um, once a year and many other events uh, before we had this pandemic since this time we have you know seen an enormous increase of interest um, both of individuals, but also of countries. So we see that worldwide, more and more countries are implementing new programs. And of course, we're delighted to see that, despite some criticism that comes from time to time, uh, despite uh, obviously the challenges there are, it is very clear that every year there's just more and more countries implementing investment migration programs. And of course, as you can imagine, we are quite pleased to see that. At the same time, we're concerned with the global refugee problem and in that regard also we are investing quite heavily in in new ideas and policies because we think the current system is broken um, so that's a, a summary <laughs> of how how i see it at the moment professor maru let me bring you into the conversation just by turning things around, the flip side, in fact, to what you just heard, because you wrote an essay in the fourth quarter edition of Henley and Partners Global Mobility Report, and it highlighted how restrictive containment measures, it seems, are becoming a permanent feature of regulating migration from the global south to the global north. Can you unpick that for us and in particular give us your take when it comes to what is happening in Europe because we've got this crisis on the Belarusian border which has unfolded and of course it has become a geopolitical issue in itself. Thank you Juliet. I think um, as a follow-up of what Christian has uh, eloquently said, I would like to um, before dealing with uh, the increasing uh, restrictive measures, restrictive policy postures that are being taken to give you a little bit of a bigger picture, um, uh, adding to what Christian has said. The first one <clears throat> is that the trend, the mega trend, if you wish, is that the absolute number of migrants have increased and it's increasing. If we compare it to the past one decade since 2010, to 2020, you have an increase of 60 million uh, total migrants uh, leaving outside their country uh, for at least two years. And that is 6 million per annum increase uh, the past 10 years. If you look at also displacement, both refugees and internally displaced within their country and refugees crossing international border, which is forced migration, not the kind of migration that I have mentioned earlier, the 281 million we have who leave their country voluntarily. This is also an increase in the past two years. There is an increase of 6 million per year. Even during the pandemic, displacement has increased. It's incredible. You can see that the voluntary movement has decreased totally in some cases a total halt has happened. But in the case of uh, displacement, it has increased, partly because of COVID, uh, because in some countries, conflicts have erupted in relation to COVID and COVID measures. Now, so the, the mega trend, the mega factors, if we take, is you have the great disruptor, COVID-19, which has affected significantly mobility of people. But we have also another mega uh, factor, which is climate change. And climate change actually is expected to displace hundreds of millions of population from their habitual residence. Uh, and it may also lead to secondary mobility beyond and outside countries. And in addition to COVID and climate change, which are big factors, you have another big factor, which is politics of identity which is playing a big role. I think Christian has mentioned in some countries, it's a cause of concern for countries even in the global north. 
that they may seek other peaceful, tranquil places. So politics of identity has also played a, a role that it creates conf conflicts that has displaced people forcefully, forcefully, but also the restrictive policies are in reaction to domestic politics of mobilized politics around election, which affects even great countries with great in, in, institutional strong rule of, rule, of, rule of law in institutions like the US under Trump. The restriction was huge and it has disrupted the migration policy systems and it has also given examples. In Europe, what we have seen, what we are looking in Poland, earlier in uh, Hungary, and now with in relation to Belarus and the Kurdish uh, refugees and others that want uh, to looking for safe place or for better opportunity, green, greener pasture, they are being affected also uh, by this development. So you have many factors coming together, playing a role. And increasingly, countries are forced to apply a containment policy, not only within their country, where Belarus is being pressured by European countries to contain migrants at the external border, but in institutions like Frontex, border control uh, agencies are moving outside their country and establishing permanent role in others' jurisdiction. This is huge, huge uh, development because normally control of entry and exit is the sovereign function on, or a sovereign act of a state uh, of the, that country. But now we have increasingly other countries also uh, playing a role. Let's follow this through because I want to bring you back to, to address some of these points, Christian, because Earlier this year, you gave a speech at a dinner which was uh, sponsored by The Economist. That uh, was actually the, the Economist, the World Ahead Gala dinner. Now, in that speech, you highlighted that as the world grapples with this unprecedented displacement crisis, at the same time, we've got an extraordinary worldwide, worldwide expansion of investment migration. So two things happening simultaneously. But you've got affluent individuals who are investing in other countries where they want to become resident. So given those two threads, can you share with us your thoughts on this concept of targeted migration and the challenges and indeed the opportunities that it can provide for sovereign states? Yeah, of course, the reason why investment migration is successful is not least because for countries it is actually very beneficial. And in fact, we have to in most countries, we have to increase the migration of people in different sectors of industry, talent, uh, investors that bring and create jobs and so on. So particularly if you look from a European perspective, where I would think the migration policies are particularly problematic, both uh, with regards to investors as well as asylum uh, seekers, uh, displaced people that seek uh, refuge in, in Europe. The whole spectrum is uh, quite uh, problematic because Europe needs migration, whether you like it or not. The question is how you do it. So even though uh, I agree uh, also uh, with the other view, what, what you said, Mehari, that in, for instance, the United States, the, you know, it has changed dramatically under Trump and there, you know, the, also there are a lot of issues. But if you look at countries like the United States or Canada, um, they manage quite well the inflow of people because they've traditionally been immigration countries and they have quite an elaborate system of, I would say, targeted migration. So they, they have no qualms about saying, oh, we need more IT engineers from India, or we need more investors, or we expand our E2 treaty investor network so that we can bring in people to start businesses and so on. Um, these kind of policies we need in Europe, and actually every country in the world needs these kind of policies, because you need talented people, you need people that do the jobs on all levels, you also need people who create jobs. This is why, you know, if you look at some of the criticism at investment migration, it is actually completely absurd 
to in some way say, oh, no, we don't want that. We don't want people who create jobs. We don't want people who invest. We don't want people to bring, you know, positivity to the country who have experience in different sectors and, you know, are talented people. We don't want that. We just want a completely chaotic, uncontrolled immigration where we don't even know the identity of these people that, that seek refuge in Europe or otherwise come into Europe. You know, this doesn't make any sense. I think it's high time, particularly for developed countries, but also all over the world. You see that also you know, in other parts of the world, in Asia, in Africa, in South America, you need much more intelligent immigration policies. You need to have targeted immigration that benefit the countries and that you know, give, give a, a new home to people who seek one, but also a new home to investments, um, where investment seeks that. And there is absolutely no problem. In fact, it is very good to give residence permits, residence status, or even citizenship to these people, provided, of course, the proper safeguards are in place in terms of the due diligence. But that is, is a matter of course. So if you look at that, we have still a long way to go for a lot more countries to improve their policies in this regard and to implement better systems, both to handle people that need that seek and need a refuge, but also people who need and seek, you know, investment opportunities that, that want to expand their international horizon and are very well prepared to bring their talent and assets and entrepreneurship to countries. So everyone actually benefits from that, also the local population, the, the host nations and, and people who who are there being employed by those investors um, around the world. So this is why investment migration is also there to stay and why it will be more and more uh, actually the norm uh, rather than the exception. There's some interesting points there, which I'd like to follow through with you, Professor, because in recent months you've written about how and why migration is weaponized in the relations between Africa and Europe. And we heard just now from Christian about how the world needs more positive migration policies that are going to deal with the global refugee crisis in a way that is more coordinated rather than sclerotic. But the weaponization of migrants is a growing phenomenon. So in layman's terms, what is this weaponization? And if it isn't dealt with now, from your perspective, what does the outlook hold for the future? Yeah, um, I think um, to an extent, it's exactly what um, <clears throat> we have been discussing now. Uh, partly, you have, uh, when you weaponize one sector, one aspect of a society, to deal with many others, it becomes problematic. Let me give you an example. The European Union, European countries, are weaponizing migration policies in a way that almost all, even development aid, financial aid, uh, diplomatic, diplomatic support and solidarity, investment, even visa issuance of Schengen or other kind of visas that are issued for individuals are now pegged whether a country is curbing irregular migration and hosting secondary migrants or even as a transit, not allowing this allowing, uh, you know, having restrictive control of border areas. That is generalization of the policy instrument. You use a migration policy uh, and that to achieve that migration migration policy objective you use other instruments at your disposal in some aspects in the on the seas on maritime domain you even use the armed forces to curb movements of uh, uh, migrants and this is weaponization of the migration policy that basically um, uh, you make other policy objectives subservient to migration policy objectives. So development is subservient to migration. Financial aid in investment trade is subservient for that. Human rights, human trend issues are subservient. So the talk of human rights, for example, is almost abandoned if you want. So you have instrumentalization of the migration policy and increasingly, uh, countries are introducing that if you are from a country where uh, there is no significant cooperation between countries on migration with Europe, then that country will have less chance of getting normal visas for 
tourism, for investment, for education, or other medical uh, uh, services. So that is basically uh, putting almost all eggs in one basket called migration containment. That is what we mean by weaponizing. And it's not going to help uh, in the long term because this is only reflective of the politics that we talked about earlier that uh, is transpired in the national politics uh, and competition for uh, political power. And this affects generally the movement in, 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 uh, in movement towards a more uh, nuanced, rational, political, and uh, economic uh, discussion about migration that Christian was mentioning. I can, I can mention one additional point here uh, that, uh, for example, you have in many countries uh, that have entered into agreement with the European Union, uh, the chance for what we call legal, legal pathways or normal mobility is narrow compared to the investment that is made on curbing irregular migration. The same amount of money, if it was used to allow individuals to apply by expanding the opportunity to move safely and orderly, legally, with full documentation and protection, then we would have probably less uh, uh, resistance to the actions that are taken to curb irregular migration and to host more uh, refugees in countries of uh, origin around the region where refugees are uh, coming. Uh, but if, as a positive trend, I must add uh, what, uh, to what Christian has said, uh, in addition to investment migration, at least in the African continent, there is one uh, development that is important uh, that will also increase significantly the uh, capacity of people to move within Africa, for, within Africa, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and its protocol on free movement, even if it's low ratification now, it has 32 sign signatory country. Uh, this is abolition of visa and residence permits. If it was to be implemented, for a continent with more than 1 billion population, it will have huge implication, including even to the index Christian has uh, pioneered. Sadly, there we have to leave it, but thank you both for your time and your valuable contribution to this opening session of Henley and Partners 15th Annual Global Citizenship Conference in what I think has been an extremely insightful and interesting discussion. A big thank you as well to our global online audience. We appreciate your interest and engagement in the Global Citizenship Conference. And if you're interested in attending the next two sessions or indeed any other upcoming webinars, then please visit the events page at henleyglobal.com. That's the events page at henleyglobal.com. In the meantime, goodbye and stay safe.